Okay, um, welcome everyone. Um, my name is uh, Octave Cornea. I'm uh, the director of the Centre de Recherche Mathematique, and uh, I'm very happy to welcome you to this uh, Nuremberg lecture series. Uh, the, this uh, lecture series was founded in uh, 2014 by a group of uh, distinguished geometers and analysts uh, in the CRM network. Um, Peng Fei Guan and uh, Dima Jacobson, uh, Josef Polterovic and Alina Stanku. And uh, the lecture is named after Louis Nirenberg, a famous geometric analyst and uh, Abel Prize winner, and uh, uh, that uh, uh, grew up in Montreal. And uh, Nirenberg was present at the first uh, editions of this series. And um, these uh, lectures uh, rapidly became one of our flagship large audience series. A uh, remarkable fact is that the first speaker in 1914 was Alessio Figali, uh, who received the Fields Medal four years later. So I guess it's good to give these lectures. It's a good. Uh... So today we are here for the last of four lectures in uh, 2022. The uh, two of the lectures were given by Professor Lu Wang from Yale, and the last two by uh, Professor Jacob Bernstein from Johns Hopkins who will give today's uh, lecture, which is a general audience lecture on complexity of submanifolds and uh, colding Minikozzi entropy. And uh, just a few words, I think uh, you heard more about uh, Jacob yesterday from uh, Yosef, but uh, just to say, uh, Professor Bernstein received his PhD in 2009 at MIT and is a professor at Johns Hopkins since uh, 2012. And he's well known for contributions on minimal surface theory and mean curvature flows. And uh, I'll give you the floor. Okay. Well, thank you for the introduction. And thank you again to the organizers for the opportunity to come and uh, give these lectures. Um, okay. So I'm going to start and uh, uh, discuss uh, the concept of, of entropy that uh, Colding and uh, Minicozzi introduced um, and try and uh, justify it as sort of a measure of uh, complexity. Um, so I, I'm going to refer to previous talks at some points, but hopefully this is self-contained. Um, okay, so maybe just before we get to the the uh, the entropy concept that they introduced, maybe let's discuss a, a more classical problem, which is just the isoparametric problem, which of course is a, um, and we'll let's just maybe focus for the moment on the situation of the plane. It's of course the the classic isoparametric inequality says that a reasonable domain in the plane, um, you can control the area of the region by the length of its boundary. Um, and it's a sharp inequality uh, that's sort of uh, uh, achieved precisely on kind of a very symmetric domain, which is the, uh, the uh, disk um, of given radius. Uh, and uh, of course, this uh, generalizes to higher dimensions, but uh, with a slightly more complicated formula. Again, in higher dimensions, it also has equality on balls. Um, so again, this is a very classical concept and uh, uh, maybe something to kind of uh, motivate some of the, the things I'll talk about uh, a little bit later in the talk is uh, when you have a, a kind of sharp inequality like uh, the isoparametric inequality, um, it's kind of natural to, to under question whether it's stable in a certain sense. So if sort of, if you're very close to being optimal or you're somehow close to the optimal configuration, um, and there's many ways to, to think about that. And uh, maybe I'll just focus because it's very uh, simple to state, but there's a, an inequality due to Bonison in the 1920s um, where he sort of showed that if you have a, a domain in the plane, um, then the sort of isoparametric defect, right? The, the point is this, this quantity is always uh, not negative, but it's only zero this. Uh, um, kind of control uh, a certain uh, relationship between the radius, radius of the, the large largest um, um, disk, disk to the side of the domain, domain and the radius of radius of the smallest disk in the chain domain. domain. So, so, right, so right, if you have right, like zero, zero, zero here, here you, you see that the two radii are the same, and so the two disks have to coincide and they're nested. Um, um, so this is a, uh, this is a, a kind of a, there's several different versions of this. This is the, the maybe the simplest one, I, or the one I like the most. And uh, so there's a nice survey uh, article by Osterman from the, the late 70s where he kind of 
discusses a whole family of these sorts of inequalities, which he calls sort of Bonnison style inequalities. Okay, so this is sort of just a, I got kind of crazy with drawing figures. So I, I, I this is sort of the, uh, the omega is the region, right? This sort of that, this sort of, this is the disk that contains it, the out radius. And I think, I don't know, but this is at least one plausible candidate for the in radius. Uh, of course, it's a, there might be, a, you know, always in these things finding the supremums or, you know, maybe I, I, I was thinking of pushing this in a little bit, but I, I got uh, lazy. Um, okay, so, uh, so this is the, uh, the, the sort of setup. Um, so let me just, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but let me just say, of course, once you have this inequality, it doesn't really depend on Euclidean space that much. So you could ask about it in a more general uh, Riemannian manifold, or you could also ask about it um, where you allow a weight in the, in the quantity. Um, and these are both very interesting and important uh, problems. Um, so maybe the closest uh, to sort of segue into what we're going to talk about Later, let me just for my remark on the so-called Gaussian isoparametric inequality, um, which again has a rich history and sort of connects a lot of different subject areas. Um, so I'm gonna use a slightly non-standard uh, normalization, which is better suited for the purposes of the talk, but uh, it's just a constant. Um, so, so the Gaussian surface area of a, say a surface um, is just a, it's not the area, but it's a sort of weighted area where you put this Gaussian weight and then you have this, uh, this normalizing constant there. And that's exactly uh, chosen so that if you take a hyperplane through the origin, you get one for the Gaussian surface area. Um, right, and the point, the observation is this weight is very rapidly decaying. So it's finite even on non-compact surfaces. Um, and then you can also think about the, for a region, you can think about the, the corresponding weighted volume, which is, uh, um, given by uh, by by just the same integral, but instead it's a uh, an integral over the domain with the Lebesgue measure. Um, okay, and then it, the point is this is uh, normalized so that the, the 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 Gaussian weighted volume of the whole space is two squared of pi, whereas you would like it to be one if this was really a probability measure. But that's just a constant. Okay, so what is the uh, isoparametric inequality uh, say. So this was proved in the 70s by Sudikov and Searlson and also by Burrell independently. Uh, and they said that if you, if you fix the Gaussian weighted volume and ask what's the smallest uh, Gaussian surface area of the, the, the boundary, um, then that's achieved by half spaces, right? So it's a little hard to write this explicitly, but essentially you get the Gaussian surface area of the boundary is, is a function of the uh, Gaussian surface area of the a Gaussian volume of the region enclosed, where it's sort of uh, determined by half spaces. Um, right? And it, I just remark, I mean, this is a, a very beautiful proof, but uh, uh, even if you kind of slightly modify some of the questions, as far as I know, this is, you know there are open questions here. So for example, if you, if you right, half spaces are not uh, symmetric with respect to reflection to the origin, that's pretty obvious. So if you ask for what about when you impose that on your regions, what are the optimal regions? Uh, as far as I know, that's still an open problem. So um, I think, for example, in the plane, I think the the conjecture, and maybe that's proved in the plane, I'm not an expert on this, is uh, that it's a, a slab. But uh, but I think there even might be some subtlety where it's a slab and then a, a, a disk, like there might be some uh, some change of topology at some, some state. Um, okay, so that's the, uh, that's sort of the, uh, uh, I think this is kind of trying to, you know, give some context. So, um, so I'm going to maybe, you know, change focus a little bit and uh, uh, discuss the Gaussian surface area as it arises in a in total kind of somewhat different subject, which is where I was more interested in it coming from, which is the, the geometric flows, which is, uh, um, uh, right, in the context of the so-called mean curvature flow. Um, <clears throat> Right. So the idea is rather than in the mean curvature flow setting, you don't think of the Gaussian surface area alone. You kind of embed it into a family of uh, different uh, rescalings and translations of the Gaussian. Um, so this was uh, certainly discussed in previous talks, but good to see it again. So right, we, we have these two parameters, which is a space point and a sort of scaling factor or time point T0. 
And we just take the Gaussian, but of course we, we dilate it, we rescale it, and we also translate it. Um, so this is a family of functionals. And, and of course the, the Gaussian surface area is just when the, the point is at the origin and the time is one. Um, so the reason this is uh, relevant to mean curvature flow is that, uh, right, if we think of the, if we sort of allow the, the T to vary in time, then this becomes a kind of the backward T kernel. And uh, Huskin in 1985 showed that for any kind of reasonable uh, mean curvature flow, um, this, uh, this, this uh, weight, this sort of family of Gaussian surface areas where he shows the, uh, the you, allow, you change time, the, the T's, the, the T parent, the T zero parameter in time along the mean curvature flow was, was not increasing. Um, okay, so so then uh, I think Lou gave a very nice discussion of mean curvature flow, but I'm not sure everyone was there. So let me try and summarize the important things in two slides. See how that goes. So right, so a mean curvature flow is, is a very natural and important uh, geometric heat equation, um, and it's sort of you can think of it as the uh, I mean, it's coming from the negative gradient flow of area. So you're sort of trying to move, a, say, a surface in the direction that decreases its area as quickly as possible. Um, and uh, you can sort of formulate that as a PDE uh, by saying the sort of uh, position of a point on the, on the flow is changing exactly with the speed given by the mean curvature vector. So, so and, and one of the things that... Uh, uh, if you take away anything from this, is that the mean curvature flow, right, it's a heat equation, so it has smoothing properties, but it also, there's a reaction term that is very strong, and in fact, the flow very often forms singularities. Um, in fact, it must form singularities in a lot of interesting situations. So, uh, so the, when you have these sort of flows, you really do need to understand the singularities. Um, uh, so, so the point about... Uh, one of the consequences, and this is again a very uh, common feature of uh, geometric PDEs, is that uh, you have this monotonicity formula, um, and that allows you to associate uh, to various points in, in this case, in space time, a, a kind of density, um, uh, which is sort of uh, measuring things about the infinitesimal behavior of the of the geometric the solutions, right? So in this case, you take the uh, the, the limit of these monotone quantities, right? This is monotone non-increasing. So this limit is well-defined and finite. Uh, and we call this limit the, uh, the Gaussian density of the flow at the space-time point X naught, T naught. Um, and of course, uh, just by the properties of the, the, the monotonicity properties, it's, it's, this density is always controlled by the, the value of the functional of the initial surface. Um, and it's a very not hard to convince yourself that if you're, again, being a little wishy-washy about classical flows and weak flows that have singularities, but if you're not on the, the flow, then it's not hard to see that the density is zero, um, basically because the, the mass of this gets very concentrated near x naught when t is very close to t naught, and that's away from the surface, so the integral is very close to zero. Um, and similarly, if you're at a sort of regular point of the flow, which is where the flow is smooth, then the density is equal to one. Uh, and that's because uh, the way we chose things, this, this, this F is sort of uh, one on a hyperplane. And if you're very at a regular point at a very small scale, you look almost flat. Like a, so it's, it also gives you one. So the point is, uh, as we'll see, kind of singular points of the flow, which are the things that are of interest, there'll be points where the density will be bigger than one. So this is sort of, this, this density is sort of a measure of how complicated the, the singularity is. Um, okay, okay, so. Once we're studying the flow, we want some solutions, and uh, a very important class of solutions are those that uh, have a symmetry. So they move by symmetry, and these are the so-called uh, self-shrinkers. Um, so these are flows that exist for all negative time, and uh, they just they're a fixed surface sigma, and they're just uh, moving by dilation in time. Um, so so we call the flow itself a self-shrinker, or we want to focus at the time minus one slice. We also could call that a self-shrinker, a self-shrinking hypersurface. Um, and it's not hard to see that for this to be a solution, if we make this an ansatz in the mean curvature flow, you end up with the surface satisfying this uh, kind of prescribed mean curvature equation. So the mean curvature vector is the minus one half of the normal part of the position vector. 
And one of the observations is that if you have a self, right, the Huskin monotonicity formula is actually the reason they're they're particularly, I mean, they're nice classes of solutions. There's lots of them, it turns out, but they're particularly nice for the regularity theory because the uh, uh, the Gaussian surface area of the, the time minus one slice is actually the the, the same uh, value you get along the flow for uh, all of the uh, um, the f of uh, these functionals. So this this is to say these are the things that are equality in the Huskin monotonicity formula, and uh, you can either see this by looking at the formula, or you can just observe that uh, right these are these things are moving by uh, there's a sort of scaling symmetry in everything and this happens to be equality just from the scaling symmetry and so particularly the density at the space-time origin of these scales is the is the, is the uh, Gaussian surface area of the of this shrinker and the point is if you're given a, a, a mean curvature flow again being a little bit vague about whether this has it's smooth or is a singular flow uh, at any point uh, space-time point uh, past the initial time, uh, you can do a rescaling around that point, a parabolic dilation. So that's a symmetry of the mean curvature flow. And uh, you can zoom in. And if you zoom in and take a limit, then you may not be able to take a limit, but you can at least take a, a, a limit, a subsequential limit. And if you do so, you'll produce a solid shrinker who's uh, uh, the top series is the Point, point. Um, um, I should say there's a very, very, uh, it's a, at least one, one is not a non, there are multiple more than one. Right? It's a very important question about whether there's a unique one or not. This hasn't really been fully resolved. Um, of course, if you do this at a regular point of the flow, you just get the, there, there's a very trivial solution of this, as we'll see, which is just a static plane. So the, the plane through the origin satisfies this. And that's just a sort of, shrinking but it's not changing so uh um that's exactly what you would do if you did this procedure at a regular point you would see a unique uh, static plane okay so what are some examples uh, so there's three slides i mean curvature flow <laughs> um right so there the, there's uh uh it's not hard to kind of uh, impose some uh symmetry assumptions and try and solve a ode and you'll if you do so you'll see that there's immediately that there's a few very trivial solutions so these are uh the so-called uh shrinking cylinders um so they're just uh there's a, a spherical factor um and when k is zero it just means this is a static plane so that's not a singularity but it is a self shrinker just to be clear um and then when k is all of n you have the this compact shrinker that's a sphere shrinking down but there's these interpolating cylinders where you have a kind of a say a like an s1 and then a, a, a radial direction so that's a shrinking down um like a cylinder. Uh, so these are, as we'll see, very important, but they're certainly not sufficient. So they're now, uh, there's a lot of numerical examples going back to Tom Illman, and, but there are now many, many rigorous constructions of shrinkers that are different than these uh, due to this list of authors. So Anginet, Ian, uh, Capuleus, Queen Moeller, uh, Dan Ketiver, and, and others. So we have lots of, a big zoo of shrinkers, um, but I want to say that these somehow should be the the most important to understand. Um, but we have to keep in mind that there are many more. So it's not enough to fully understand these in general. Um, and these are particularly important because they uh, they sort of can be characterized in several natural ways that are important, not only from just their geometric uh, importance, but actually they, they, there are things that are arising in the flow. So um, if, you, if you look at uh, so-called mean convex, singularities so these are things where the mean curvature has a sign so that's a condition that's preserved by mean curvature flow so that's always important and uh it basically means the flow is moving to one side so it's a very it has a very geometrically natural um interpretation so the only shrinkers that are mean convex turn out to be these cylinders so that's uh that was due to huskin and then colby minicozzi relaxed some hypotheses he had but the the, the basic idea is huskin um, so Col Minicozzi also showed that they sort of provide the only so-called stable singularity models. So um, I don't want to say what that means exactly, but uh, that means that somehow these should be the one that one would hope that these are sort of the generic singularities of the flow. I think Lou discussed this a little more in detail. Uh, Brendel showed that uh, 
if the shrinker is embedded, I should say there's an embeddedness assumption here, but if it's embedded and gene is zero, so for example, topologically a sphere, topologically a cylinder, but not topologically a torus, uh, then it has to be one of these. So, and again, topology is something that's sort of presumably preserved by the flow, um, at least as long as it's smooth. Um, and then, uh, so uh, again, this is something I think Wu talked about, but uh, we, we actually showed that the only singularity models in R3, where the density is below that of the, the cylinder, is, uh, is actually uh, has to be one of these guys. So we'll come back to that. But uh, basically, they're, they're, um, these are particularly natural from the point of view of uh, ways you can characterize shrinkers. Um, OK, so having said all that, what is the Colby Minicosi entropy? I, part of the title, I should probably have defined it. Uh, so we have seen it in previous talks, but let me remind you. So the idea is you have this family of functionals uh, that are monotone for the flow that are related to, that have monotone properties with respect to the flow. Um, but uh, they're somewhat uh, problematic in that they're not really uh, respecting the, the symmetries of the flow. So the mean curvature flow is translation invariant. I mean, in the sense that you can translate and get a flow, it's a dilation invariant parabolically. So in space time, um, but none of these functionals are symmetric in that sense. Um, maybe a little bit worse is they're particularly interesting if you want to relate the, the value at the initial hypersurface with the density of a singularity. But the point is you need to know where the singularity is in space time to choose the right functional to kind of compute how to control it. And obviously that's like, that's, you don't want to do that. You want to just focus on the initial hypersurface. Um, so, because of these, uh, there's a kind of uh, obvious uh, idea to just sort of get rid of them that turned out to be very uh, uh, um, useful. So maybe not so obvious, but uh, certainly one way to get rid of all of these issues is to take the supremum of all of these, uh, these values of a, a surface, um, right? So either take the supremum of the family of functionals, uh, you can see by a change of variables, that's the same as taking the Gaussian surface area of scalings and translations of the surface. So these are two different ways of seeing the same thing. And we call that the colby minicosi entropy or just the entropy of the surface or submanifold or hypersurface. Uh, and the point is, since these are built out of, uh, out of these monotone quantities, it's not hard to see that along a mean curvature flow, uh, the entropy of the initial surface controls the entropy of the later surfaces. And that also controls the Gaussian density at any point. Okay, so you, you get this uh, uh, control on the kinds of singularities that, that you can see. And the hope is that the, the claim is that this somehow is the complexity of the singularity. So the complexity of the initial surface controls the complexity of the singularity in, in some vague sense. Um, I think that's maybe one reason to call it entropy. Um, but again, while this quantity was sort of introduced in the context of mean curvature flow, um, Right, it's totally, it's sort of this definition has nothing to do with mean curvature flow. So you can just study this quantity in its own right. And I sort of want to make the claim that it's an interesting thing to study. And maybe you use mean curvature flow as a tool to study it, but it's uh, certainly something you can uh, investigate independent of mean curvature flow. Um, and in particular, one of the things you would like to uh, justify is that uh, maybe be, this is entropy in more sense than just this heat equation perspective. I mean, maybe it really does measure something about the complexity of the object. Um, so and hopefully we'll see that it indeed does. Okay, so uh, the first thing is it's good to have some value. So let's just see how you might compute this um, in a few cases, right? So suppose we start with P, which is just the plane through the origin, um, right? And uh, so this is a shrinker if, if you care, but we're not gonna think about it that way. Uh, so of course, if you dilate it or translate it, you're just getting parallel planes geometrically. Um, so if you wanna compute the Gaussian surface area of these, uh, these uh, dilations or translations, it's just the, the parallel planes. And it's not hard to see that that's either minus P squared over four. And so then it's a simple calculus exercise to see that the, this quantity is maximized when T is zero, so the entropy is one. Uh, and in fact, right, it's not hard to see that for any hypersurface, Right, because you're looking at all scales and translating freely, right? You can always control the entropy of a hypersurface by the entropy of its standard plane at a given point, which has to be one because it's a plane. So the entropy of any hypersurface is bigger than one, 
and the entropy of the hyperplane is one. So this starts to maybe suggest that the entropy is measured in some kind of complexity because of course the plane is the simplest hypersurface. Um, I should say, I don't wanna write this in a slide. You could of course ask what happens, is this rigid? So what happens if you have a hypersurface with entropy one? Um, so that actually is a little subtle. So uh, my PhD student, uh, uh, Wei Tian Chen, he used mean curvature flow to show that uh, for pretty much any hypersurface, the entropy is one only if it is the hyperplane. His proof used mean curvature flow. Some, it was pointed out to me, I haven't checked the details, that if you actually go back to the Gaussian isoparametric inequality, right, that's a rigid inequality. And uh, it seems possible that you could actually use that rigidity to also prove this rigidity here. So there's sort of some further connections. I haven't uh, explored that. And th there's some subtleties with this becoming very wild at infinity that I'm not 100% sure about, but uh, just mentioned. Okay, so there's, that's, the so what are the next simplest things? The next simplest things are spheres, right? So how do we calculate the entropy of say the unit sphere? Um, so again, we could in principle sort of write it down explicitly and try and do calculus, but uh, that gets a little messy. So let's maybe you, this is where we start seeing that it is makes sense to think of it in terms of mean curvature flow. Um, so let's say we use the monotonicity properties of the flow, um, right? So we can, since the, since the sphere itself is not a shrinker, but a, you know, a dilation of it is, we get this self-shrinking flow uh, given here. Um, and the point is, if we want to compute the, the value of this functional at the time minus one slice, by the monotonicity formula, that's uh, bounded from above by the backwards limit, the t goes to minus infinity of this, this value. This is just used for monotonicity. Um, but the point is we can do, again, I, it's maybe, if you look at the integral, it's, it's not hard to see that there's a, a parabolic symmetry that allows you to take the t off m and get minus one, but then put it onto the, the two terms here. And so now we're just taking a limit here and we see that the x naught is fixed so that when you divide by this very large number it goes to zero and t zero also gets killed off and you're just left with one. So you see that this value is always dominated by the value at zero one. And so um, you see that uh, the, uh, the entropy of this uh, scaled sphere is exactly the, uh, the Gaussian area of the scaled sphere, um, which is to say the entropy of the sphere is the Gaussian area of the scale sphere. So we get an explicit value. And uh, again, I think uh, Lou may have mentioned this, but it's always good to see again, right? So if we wanna find out the exact values, right? Uh, this was thankfully already done by us by, by Stone in 1994. Um, so he found that say the entropy of S1 is this uh, square root of two pi over E, which is about 1.52. Uh, the entropy of S2 is four over E, which is about 1.47 uh, and maybe, sort of importantly for some of the later ideas in the talk, the entropies have this dimensional monotonicity. So as you increase the dimension, the entropy of the sphere is decrease and then limit to the value square root of two and they strictly decrease. Okay, so uh, in general, as I said, we're taking a supremum. So it's kind of a little bit tricky to get exact values in general, but uh, there's a few other situations where we can get uh, uh, explicit values. For example, if we, if we start with a hypersurface in Rn plus one and find it across it the line, or, or you could even find either actor the hypersurface in Rn plus one, plus one, because it's a little bit too in the surface, then the, and then the entropies are the same, definitely because of the way we uh, formalize the Gaussian weight. Um, and more generally, right, this proof I gave for the sphere didn't really use anything about the sphere, it just used that it was a self shrinker. So uh, as observed sort of by Colby Minicosi, the same proof basically tells you that uh, if you have a self-shrinker, then the entropy of the self-shrinker is the same as its Gaussian surface area. Okay, so that's uh, some other entropy contributions. Okay, so now uh, going back to the flow to maybe justify a few conjectures, uh, right? So there's a, a very important technique or idea or uh, observation that you see in a lot of different geometric PDEs, especially critical geometric PDEs, uh, which are the so-called sort of epsilon regularity results, right? So right, you might not be able to get uh, smoothness, but below a certain energy threshold, you do get smoothness. And trying to understand what that energy threshold is, is very interesting. Um, so, uh, right, so the, 
So there's, this basically appears in all kinds of different problems, but in the context of uh, mean curvature flow, uh, you can sort of uh, go to work of Bracchi in the 70s, and then especially if you look at a reformulation of it by White, um, you, you definitely get a very clear example of this for mean curvature flow where you use sort of what we would now call entropy as the, the measure of uh, energy. Um, right, so specifically, uh, what you can say is that if you have a non-flat self-shrinker, which is precisely the singularity you would get, a, a sort of the model you would, the singularity would, mo the, the model shrinker you would get at a singularity, uh, then the entropy can't be one. It has to be strictly bigger than one. Um, and in fact, and this is the epsilon regularity part, there's a, some dimensional constant bigger than one, right? One is the zero energy state, the plane. There's a, there's a uniform constant depending only on dimension. So any not flat shrinker, so any singularity has to be bigger than this epsilon of n. Uh, and in particular, right, if you have a mean curvature flow that forms a finite time singularity, right, that means there has to be a point with Gaussian density, at least that of this, of a non-flat self-shrinker, so Gaussian density, at least epsilon n. So that means the entropy of the, the flow itself has to be uh, at least uh, epsilon of n. Um, and the idea, again, this goes back to, I think, something Lou, Lou mentioned, that if you start with a closed hypersurface, one of the basic properties of mean curvature flow is that for a closed hypersurface, there is a finite time singularity of the flow. And so we see that the closed hypersurface uh, must have entropy at least this epsilon n. Um, and so then the, the question you then pose uh, is to, to try and understand, can you, what is the optimal choice of epsilon of n? And the hope, or at least the, the, the conjecture, as we'll see, was that since it's supposed to measure complexity, you want to look at the simplest and the simplest closed surface is not the plane, but rather the sphere, right? It's the most symmetric um, in some sense, hopefully, right? Right, so this is, uh, this is sort of the, the, the hope, and uh, this was the conjecture of Colding, Ilman, and in, Inacosi, and White in, uh, in a paper, I guess it was published in 2013. Um, right, so suppose you have a, a closed hypersurface in R plus one, the conjecture is that the entropy is at least that of the sphere. And moreover, you have equality. You have a rigid inequality. You have a rigid, rigid inequality. So you, uh, you saturate the inequality precisely on uh, scalings and translations of the sphere, right? Um, okay, so that's the conjecture. And uh, the point is that uh, this is now a theorem, as we'll see, but uh, um, the point is the properties of mean curvature flow uh, immediately give you the sort of before they made the conjecture, this was already proved, just had to uh, interpret it properly, uh, when the, the ambient dimension was two, so in the context of curves in the plane, um, uh, or if the initial surface, the initial hypersurface had some kind of curvature condition. So for example, if it's convex or mean convex, those are properties where we understand the singularities of the flow so well that we could approve this very quickly. Um, so, so as sort of evidence towards this conjecture, the, uh, this group uh, did show it for self-shrinkers. Sorry, this should say for closed, yeah, self-shrinkers. So it's closed self-shrinkers, right? That's sort of implicit. Um, and they observed, of course, as we'll see, that if you could prove it for all non-flat self-shrinkers, you would get this result, but they could only prove it for closed self-shrinkers. So uh, you might think that's enough, but as we'll see, that's uh, not enough, um, what they proved. Uh, so we've we worked with Lou, uh, we, we showed it, the, the, the whole conjecture, up to dimension six. Um, and our proof was restricted to, I mean, we exclude n equal one, which was already known. Um, the, the proof was, uh, the restriction in our proof with the upper dimension was, again, there's this thing you often see in this uh, submanifold problem, so this minimal surface problems is, there's, a, there's a, something that happens when the ambient dimension is eight, where there exists stable minimal cones which don't exist in lower dimensions. And so there's, a, there's issues with regularity that get more tricky. Um, so, so our proof required regularity theory. So we, we were restricted to this dimension. Uh, Jonathan Zhu, in a very nice result, sort of showed, showed that in fact, our argument held in all dimensions. You could get around these regularity issues in a very elegant way. So, uh, so the theorem is now, this is now a full theorem that's completely known. Uh, okay, so, so what is the idea of the proof? Um, 
Right, so let's look at this simple case where everything is sort of easy and hopefully uh, we can understand it. Um, when you're in n equal one, right, this follows from this earlier work from the 80s on what's called curve shortening flow, because now we're looking at curves in the plane. So mean curvature flow becomes what's called curve shortening flow. Uh, right, and so the idea is, uh, let's say you start with a closed curve and you look at the sort of maximal evolution by mean curvature flow, right? So we know that T has to be finite because we know it's closed and it has to form a singularity in finite time, um, right? And uh, we're starting with this embedded curve uh, so we can appeal to this work of Grayson that says an embedded curve remain, all curves remain embedded by the flow and all, all hypersurface, embedded hypersurfaces, that's what curves in, in particular. What he showed is not, not only do, uh, and again, Lou discussed this, but uh, an embedded curve as it evolves, not only stays embedded, but eventually becomes convex before it becomes singular. So after some finite amount of time, the, the M0 has evolved to a convex curve. Uh, and then this work of Gage and Hamilton says that once you have a convex curve, the evolution remains convex. And in fact, uh, eventually as it becomes singular, it becomes more and more round. So it, become, it disappears in what's called a round point. So it becomes uh, singular just as in a way modeled precisely on a shrinking sphere. Um, so in particular, we get that the, uh, the uh, Gaussian density at this singular point is exactly the entropy of the circle and the entropy of the initial guy is bounded from above. So we get the inequality. And you also see that uh, you have strict inequality unless you sort of have a strict equality in the monotonicity formula of Huskin, which is only possible if the flow itself is a shrinking uh, circle. So, so you not only get the, uh, the inequality, you get the rigidity from this argument. Um, all right, so that's the n equal one proof. Um, okay, so uh, so what about higher dimensions? So uh, so the observation here is that the result of of, uh, of gauge that the the uh, general uh, embedded curve becomes convex before before it becomes singular is very special to dimension one or dimension two like curves. Uh, Right, so there's this classic example, which again, I think Lou mentioned was the, of a neck pinch. So you have two two-dimensional spheres joined by a very small neck. The spheres shrink, but the neck shrinks much faster and that pinches off before the spheres shrink. So you end up with a, um, a singularity uh, before the flow disappears um, or and clearly before it becomes convex. Uh, okay, so, so we definitely can't appeal to the gauge result um, so it, it's worth mentioning that there is another result about curves that is special, but maybe is a little bit more helpful. Um, so Abresh and Lang are also in the 80s. They basically classified all singularity models of embedded curve shortening flow. And in fact, immersed curve shortening flow, um, or at least closed ones. So uh, essentially from their work, it follows that the only embedded uh, shrinkers in R2 is the straight line, which is not a singularity model or the shrinking circle, right? Um, so if you don't want to use the gauge result, you can just argue as follows, which is start with your closed curve, run the flow, you know it must form a singularity somewhere, and you don't care about convexity or embeddedness, you can just appeal to this result of Abrash Langer and say the singularity model has to be a circle. So uh, you get the same result, um, modulo some, some issues of multiplicity that are irrelevant. Uh, the, the issue is again, this doesn't quite work because, of course, in higher dimensions, as I mentioned, there's a whole zoo of, of shrinkers. So there's many, many singularity models. And so uh, you, you can't just uh, directly get such a simple proof. You have to do something that kind of forces singularities to have a well-understood type to, to develop. Um, right. So uh, a good example is if you're mean convex, right, that's preserved by the flow and forces all singularity models to be cylinders, and you know among cylinders, the one with the lowest entropy is exactly the sphere. So uh, that, that is the singularity, right? So, so if you, in the mean convex case, you could sort of argue with this proof very easily. Basically, it doesn't matter that the mean convex guy has a, say, a neck pinch before it disappears. Uh, the, sing the density there is as big as you, you would get at the, the sphere anyway. Um, uh, another uh, is this uh, result I mentioned about uh, uh, 
the beginning. So Gu and I also classified in dimension three, these very low entropy shrinkers. Um, so we, the low entropy ones are precisely the plane, which is, as I said, not a singularity model, the sphere and the cylinder. And again, Lou, I think, discussed this in her talk, but uh, uh, you again see the sphere has less entropy than the cylinder. So this is the smallest entropy of a singularity. So dimension three, you, can, you don't need to worry. You can just look at the first singular time. Um, however, in the full proof, the one in every other dimension, uh, you can't look at the first singular time. You really have to go to a later singularity, um, and that requires the use of a flow through singularity. So it's a much more technically uh, involved uh, proof. And basically, the idea is that what we can show is that there's a distinction between the singularity and the singularity with the flow vanish, vanish, right? right? So we can sort of short the same thing, thing, but in higher, higher dimensions, they have to be different. And, and uh, essentially, essentially, you know, show that at the point, the points where the flow here appears, the shrinkers you get are, are, are stable in a certain sense. They're not stable in the holding and closing sense necessarily, but they're stable in a certain sense. Because somehow you, you can imagine you can't kind of curve away disappearing. So that's somehow stable in a certain way. Uh, and in particular, uh, we're able to prove that these stable like shrinkers do have entropy, at least that of the sphere. Um, so I have a, this is a, I don't know how helpful this is, but maybe this illustrates some of the ideas heuristically, right? So these are these are you know curves. Of course, this is a, this is a perfectly valid picture of curve shortening flow, right? So here we see this curve shrinking down, getting very close to round, and then disappearing, um, right? So this is the t is the singular time where it disappears. Uh, here is a picture. This is not a curve shortening flow because, of course, we somehow have a singularity where it doesn't disappear. But you can imagine this being like a like a cross section of, say, a higher dimensional picture, right? So here we see a, this would be like a neck, right? So we we come down. Maybe we have a neck pinch here, and then we keep going, and then we get to these. Uh, maybe this T three is before T, so that's a that's a flow where part, a component disappears. But let's go all the way to where the whole flow disappears, which is T, right? Um, so, uh, so the observation uh, and the, the key to the proof is that, uh, say, if it was mean convex, this would be a cylinder, and that's okay. But if we don't have any convexity assumption, this could be a very wild singularity that we can't say anything about. Um, so we would really be stuck if we just stopped here. But in our proof, if we go all the way to here, this thing is much more stable than this. And somehow, because of that, for reasons I don't want to get into, that actually can be much more can be said about it, and we can prove the result um, by looking at that singularity. Okay, so that's uh, that's the uh, the proof. Um, and so then maybe the final remark is maybe let's talk a little bit about some stability results for this sharp inequality that again maybe give evidence that it's a measure of complexity. Um, right. So again, going back to this idea, if we have a sharp inequality, right, we want to understand how stable it is. In various senses, and so uh, what we observed with our classification of low entropy self shrinkers was that uh, we had a sort of topological stability for the inequality. Um, so what we could show is that if you had a closed surface, oh, that's a typo, sorry, and the entropy was less than that of the cylinder, which is to say that of the shrinking circle, uh, then the surface was isotopic to the two sphere, right? Or another way to think about this is if you have a closed surface in R3 with positive genus, then the entropy has to be strictly bigger than the uh, entropy of the cylinder, right? So there's this whole range of entropies between S2 and S1 where there's only topological spheres. Um, and, uh, right, so this is a notion of stability in the topological sense. If you're close to being optimal, for this entropy inequality, you, you, you restrict the topology, which I, again, is kind of interesting because there really isn't something like that for the, the isoparametric inequality. This is really about the fact that the, the entropy is looking at all scales simultaneously, which is a sort of stronger. Um, it's much closer in some ways to the Whitmore energy. Uh, um, okay, and I should say this is pretty close to sharp because uh, what you can imagine is you take these spheres that are very far apart and you start joining them by very small necks and you can basically build something of arbitrarily complex genus, arbitrarily high genus, but it's probably has entropy very close to that of the cylinder. So uh, somehow this, this, these results are very good at seeing things in very low, this good measure very close to the bottom, but it gets a little bit less uh, precise as you get higher. Um, okay, so that's one, one stability result. 
Uh, so the previous argument really heavily used uh, the classification of, uh, of uh, low entropy uh, shrinkers, which of course we don't have access to in higher dimensions um, in the full form uh, for, for, for many reasons. But uh, um, we do, however, have some, I would say, we still have something we can say, say in one dimension higher. And uh, that's just enough to let us prove another topological stability result, um, though it's much harder. And uh, so we were able to show that in, in uh, for a three manifold in R4, sorry, this should be a closed I, well, surface, generalized surface, three-dimensional surface. So for a closed surface in, in R4, a closed hypersurface in R4, uh, if the entropy is less than that of the, uh, the cylinder, so the but the right cylinder, so S two is the the right sphere to compare with. Uh, then the 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 so manifold is actually isotopic to S three, um, right? And again, there's a gap here between S three entropy of S three and entropy of S two. So there's a there's definitely lots of things that satisfy this. Uh, this result was attained sort of more or less at the same time by uh, different methods by Chodosh, Choi, Mantelidis, and Schultz. Um, and I should say that uh, we had previously proved a result of this type where instead of getting isotopic, we had proved diffeomorphic. Um, so of course, in R3, whether you're diffeomorphic to S2 or isotopic to S2 is the same. That's Alexander's theorem. Um, in R4, this is an open problem. This is the Schoenfeld conjecture. So you can kind of interpret what we prove as some kind of low entropy version of the Schoenfeld's problem. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, well, I don't want to say any more about it, but uh, so yeah, this is sort of a, a low entropy version of it. Um, and, and I should say that the new ingredient for this was uh, that we had to understand certain other special solutions of the flow, not the shrinking solutions, but the so-called expanding solutions. Um, so that was the topic of, the, of my previous talk. Uh, what was exactly the kind of uh, tools we needed for that. Um, and I should say, I mean, again, I think this was a very nice problem, uh, at least in my opinion, because it allowed us to prove a bunch of other interesting things. So it gave us a lot of good problems, questions to study. So I think that's the mark of a good problem is it generates more good problems. So, uh, um, okay, so that was our uh, the topological stability result. So let me, let me maybe end back at sort of the beginning, which is a, a kind of geometric stability result, um, right? So it's something, it's not exactly the Bonnison inequality, but I think it's sort of, maybe it fits in this, this Osterman idea of a Bonnison-like inequality, um, right? So the Bonnison inequality, I didn't mention this, but it's not hard to see that that's very two-dimensional, right? You really can't control something like that in higher dimensions, like a thin, a thin strip in two dimensions has very high length, but it, if you look one dimension higher, a thin spike has negligible area. So stability in higher dimensions is, is different for the isoparametric inequality. Um, but again, because the entropy is looking sort of at all scales, a, a thin spike might still have large entropy. And we sort of were able to uh, quantify that, um, right? So what we were able to show in dimension three and my student generalized it to higher dimensions was uh, if you have a closed, surface in R3 and your entropy is uh, sufficiently close to the, the saturating value, right? So it's definitely bounded from below by lambda S2, but we're saying it's very close to lambda S2. Uh, then, you know, if we look at the in and the out radius, right, of the surface, the, the, two the three dimensional analog, so with balls instead of disks, uh, right, we can, we can uh, control the ratio. It's always bounded by below by one, but we can control it above by as close to one as we like, right? So it's, uh, um, right. It, and, and again, this is a little bit different than the way it was stated before, but if you think about it, this, this, this sort of uh, delta, this sort of uh, entropy defect is scale invariant, right? Which is not the case of the, the uh, isoparametric defect that I wrote down. So this is sort of the, the this, this of course is also scale invariant, which is what you expect. Um, and again, in our proof, uh, we used a, a classification of low entropy uh, cell shrinkers, but uh, my, my other, another student of mine, Sheng Lin Wang, uh, in his thesis was able to uh, uh, use a lot more 
GM geometric measure theory machinery and to show that this wasn't uh, needed and you could actually prove this in, in every dimension. Um, so uh, I think uh, uh, I think this is uh, the end of the talk. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for a beautiful talk. Uh, questions or comments? So yeah, yeah, I have a, a bit of a naive question. So why is this called entropy? <laughs> well, okay, I didn't name it, but I think the idea, at least, that it's monotone under a heat equation. So that's sort of entropy is so the universe is increasing. So now in our, their case, they have the wrong sign. So they have the entropy decreasing, but whatever, for mathematicians. So, because, but yeah, I think that's maybe the motivation. Well, because for flow, sometimes it's, I, I guess, uh, terminology I know, it's called the Lyapunov function, right? Um, yeah, so that's another way, another way. But, they uh, also, you can also think of it as But a, of course, yeah, entropy is much more interesting name. So, yeah, I think, right. I think I said yesterday, it's more sexy. I asked the same question yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and uh, I have a second question, which is a bit, also a bit off, maybe, uh, which is that um, this starts a little bit from um, a, a curve shortening, which is in the plane. And there are two ways to extend curves. One, one is uh, hypersurfaces, and the other one is Lagrangian submanifolds. Mm -hmm. And there is a mean uh, curvature flow, I think, for Lagrangian submanifolds. My question was, is there something, is there some understanding of singularity? There's some, but it's a much harder problem. Um, and uh, I would say to really make to be able to say something non-trivial in that setting, you would to, you would need a good notion of weak solution. But mm. the, the problem is the Lagrangian condi condition does not really necessarily preserved past the singularity huh. without like a lot of more work that I think is not really fully okay. done. So I, I think somehow in the Lagrangian setting, that's like work in progress that who knows when it'll mm. be progressing but somehow the the issue is uh i think the real stumbling block is that we really have to use weak solutions yeah and you just can't talk about i mean you can talk about weak solutions but they just stop being lagrangian after the first singularity so uh okay. and that's that's really i think the, uh, i'm not sure what else you can say and maybe just going back to the first question i think another way you can think of entropy is sort of you know information content and you know you know Complexity should have, have, you know, complex random things should have, you know, very little information content, but very structured things should have lots of information content as opposed to plain and here as opposed to most structured surface surfaces. That's why they have the lowest entropy. Again, we're going to assign them all. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Are the questions, by the way, if there are any questions on Zoom, please unmute yourself or write in chat. So maybe I'll ask a question in the meantime. So I, I, I really liked your uh, uh, last result on the stability. And uh, I'm wondering if uh, uh, you know how epsilon depends on delta. So OK, so I didn't want to. It's very technical. So we did in our proof, we actually do get a kind of more effective estimate. Um, so we can basically say that uh, there's some constant we can't control. But is it sharp? Like basically, my question is like there is a, a whole uh, business of sharp uh, 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 is parametric inequality. So at least in the context of the classical the parametric inequality, so you can uh, essentially say exactly how this the parametric defect. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's the bonus. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. so so. Uh, so I I would say we can't do that. We we uh, we can get better than this is very very mm -hmm. qualitative. We can get a little bit more quantitative, but it's definitely not sharp. So mm -hmm. it's I mean there's like there's a constant we don't know. And then there's a, a power. Oh, there's a power. There's a power, and our power is wrong. Right? Do you have a conjecture? What's the right power? I would. <laughs> I mean, it's not you don't plausible want that it's <laughs> one. We get a one. I think one quarter, one eighth. I don't remember, but it should probably be a half. But we just can't. Uh, I mean, it is. We definitely it was not. It's not a sharp result. What we get. So that would I think be. A, so there is still some room for. Oh, there's quite a bit of room. And then I should say that our proof. Is that result is only in R3. So the Sheng Wen result does, can, can't prove the quantitative estimate at all because somehow our proof is using that it's a smooth. So in the end, in R3, when you're very close to the cylinder, you have a smooth flow up to the singular time. There's no intermediate singularities. And that's very important in this proving this quantitative part. 
Um, of course, in the uh, higher dimensions, there, there may be singularities that you have to flow past, um, and that doesn't work well with the architecture. Yeah, much harder. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I think that's a, there's a lot, there's definitely a lot of room there. And uh, I, I mean, there's a many, I think there's other ways you can interpret it that have interesting perspectives that uh, I think we didn't, uh, I think there's a lot to explore here that I think is kind of uh, uh, nice. Um, and uh, I think also just thinking about it without, I mean, curvature flow would be great. Uh, mm -hmm. I think if you could, like, I, I was sort of interested in this idea of uh, using this uh, stability of the, the couch and isotermic inequality that they think. Um, mm -hmm. I think that might have some, some, some interesting ideas there. Regarding to the conjecture, if, say, the closed surface, the topology is simple, for example, starship, um, and you work in that direction. For the, the Gaussian isoparametric uh, problem? No, no, there's an entropy conjecture for that. Uh, Go back to, 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 to that. Yeah. So this, this is completely solved. I'm sorry? This is completely solved. A complete solve? Yeah. For, for any close? Any close. So, okay. Yeah. Sorry, maybe I should have written it as a zero, sure. but, um, but yeah, if it's star shape, Star shape is actually probably fits into this framework of mean convex because that that yeah, is a preserved. It to be mean convex. But star shape, there's a way of, there is, it is a kind of there's a preserved condition that is part of. So, um, like if you're star shaped, right? I mean, it's not mean convex, but star shaped has a is a condition that has a good properties under the mean curvature flow. It doesn't it, star shapeness isn't preserved, but it's it's part of a. Uh, there is a condition that is preserved that star shapeness is part of. And so that should, that condition should really restrict singularity models. So I think even if you didn't have all this work, star shapeness would probably be not so hard to handle by uh, uh, more classical methods. Uh, my, uh, I haven't done it, but I, I think that's uh, plausible. Uh, in Tuesday's talk, Luo mentioned a result that uh, if a closed uh, hypersurface in R n plus one is not a wrong sphere, then there is a gap between its entropy and the wrong spheres. Yeah, so that's for shrinkers. Oh, or, or, or this for three? Yeah, yeah so, so it's not hard to see that if you just take the round sphere and do a very small perturbation of it that has arbitrarily so close. The last result you mentioned is for general hyperservices. Yeah, this is this 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 uh this result is for general surfaces. Okay, right? okay. So right. That's Correct. that's why I say it's like a Bonnison like inequality. So Bonnison is about any surface or any any domain in the plane, like when you're not close to being optimal for the isoparametric inequality, can you say something about the geometry of the domain? So uh, it's the same thing here. We have any closed surface in R three if sort of the entropy is close to the entropy of the uh, sphere, okay. then we can say something about the geometry of the surface. Okay, another question, uh, entropy of self shrinkers. So uh, it, is there, so we know that self shrinkers is entropy has gaps. So uh, well, how can a number be an entropy of uh, self shrinker? Is, is there, is it fully proved? Well, what, what number can be an entropy of self-shrinker? Like what is the spectrum of, yeah, yeah. I think that's a pretty hard problem. I'm, okay. I'm not sure there's, I suspect, I suspect there's lots of things because I think, for instance, I mean, there's these examples of Capuleus, Queen and Moeller, where they essentially, they take a shrinking sphere and a shrinking plane and they sort of desingularize them. So okay. the entropy of the, union of the sphere and the plane is like the entropy of the sphere plus the entropy of the plane. But they get this sequence of with that are smooth and the entropy of those should sort of converge to the entropy of the, the limit. So basically you can have, there, there's points of accumulation even. It's not like, the, the, it's not even a discrete set. I mean, or yeah, it's not a discrete set. So it's, I think it's a very complicated to describe, but we get a very nice picture, at least in R3 at the very bottom and that might generalize in higher dimensions. But once you get above the cylinder, there's a little gap above the cylinder and then I, it's unclear what's going on. So, uh, and it could get pretty pretty crazy up there. Um, Thank you. Uh, I get a really naive question. Uh, in the isopermit inequality, um, I mean, is it uh, any hope of 
having an upper bound or is there any construction with arbitrary large uh, entropy? So an upper bound for entropy? Yes. Uh, I think in general, you can make entropy as large as you like. So there is an interesting question, which is if you're given a convex region, what's the highest entropy? And I think there's like, was a naive, you can naively think it might be maybe this, the cube, but there's some examples that show the cube is not the highest bound. And I think that the entropy of the cube in the dimen as dimension increases is something like the square root of the dimension. I, this is the stuff, there's some interesting convex geometry about the, the entropy of convex regions that I think has not been fully, there's fully, fully understood. But I think in 2D, maybe it has to be two, which is because you kind of take a, a rectangle that's, you know, unit side length and gets longer and longer. And the entropy of that as the side goes bigger should be uh, approaching two. I think I'd be confident to say two is the optimal in, in the plane, but I don't even know if that's true. I'm just, a, that's just a, I guess. All right, so thank you very much again. And uh, let's thank both Lou and Jim for this wonderful series of lectures. And thank you for attending. And thank you for that. And can we thank the organizers for lovely. <laughs>